I've noticed this. I don't know if you have, Brandon, but I've noticed that in many of my discussions with non-believers, when I ask them, if Christianity were true, would you become a Christian? Most of the time, the honest answer is no. They don't want it to be true. They're not on a truth quest or on a happiness quest. I think God gives us enough evidence to know who he is, but he gives us enough freedom to go the way we want to go. And by the way, nobody out there is ignorant that God exists. Everybody knows there's a creator God, but you don't need the Bible to know it. You know that if there's a creation, there's got to be a creator. You know if there's design, there's got to be a designer. You know if there's a moral law written on your heart, there's got to be a moral law giver. What happens to people who have never heard about Jesus? People who have never heard about the gospel or people who have never encountered the gospel of Jesus, and they've never had an opportunity of saying yes to this glorious and wonderful gospel message about the death and the resurrection of Jesus. This is a question we are trying to answer today based on the conversation that happened between Daily Dose of Wisdom and a philosopher and a scholar, author named Frank Turek, someone that I respect and admire. He has done so much work for the Christian faith, especially on the aspect of apologetics. Two of his most influential books that I've come across is a book called I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. And another book is based on why atheists need to steal from God so that they can argue against God. So he is someone who is very influential and very involved within the Christian space, especially of apologetics. So they were discussing this very question. What happens to people who have never heard about Jesus? Jesus and never got the opportunity of receiving the gospel, are they therefore condemned to eternal judgment just because they never heard about Jesus? Let's listen to it. I submit to you, and you know, a lot of people ask me, like, if I if I could go back into a time machine, when, when, when would I go back to? I would go back to the resurrection. I wouldn't go back to the crucifixion. Why? Because I'd probably be, be one of the ones crucifying him. Mm. You claim to be God? Why don't you take yourself down from that cross? I'd be saying the same thing. I'd want to see if he really did rise from the dead. That's what I would want to witness. This is very powerful and significant for us as Christians to actually ponder on and actually take this point as valid. What actually saves us, when Paul speaks of this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, what actually saved us, what saved me and you, what took us from being sinful people that rejected God and rebelled against God and his instruction, what actually saved us from the penalty, the power, and the bondage of sin was not the death of Jesus Christ. What saved us from the penalty of sin was not even the birth of Jesus Christ. What actually saved us was the resurrection of Jesus Christ. His crucifixion, his death, his birth are important in the gospel story, but they are not what actually saved us. They were not the main instruments that actually led us to being saved. What saved me and you is the fact that Jesus rose from the dead, and when he rose from the dead, he defeated both sin and death. This is what saves us. And when Paul speaks of this in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he says, if Christ is not risen from the dead, then me and you are still dead in our sins. He says that if we don't believe in the resurrection of the dead not only the resurrection of jesus but also the resurrection of us the fact that jesus rose from the dead and he overcame sin and death if we don't have the very same faith and believe that even with us when god comes to judge the world that even we too will be resurrected from the dead he says if you don't have that notion and understanding of the resurrection from the dead he says then me and you are the most to be pitied amongst all men that if we have not placed our faith in the resurrection of christ as a means that propels us to also be resurrected in the day of the coming of the lord he says that then me and you are the most to be pitied amongst all men that our faith is in vain so the most important thing that actually makes christianity christianity is the fact that jesus rose from the dead and i think god gives us enough evidence to know who he is but he gives us enough freedom to go the way we want to go. Mm. And by the way, nobody out there is ignorant that God exists. Everybody knows there's a creator God. You know that not from the Bible. Well, you do know that from the Bible. You don't need the Bible to know it. You know that if there's a creation, there's got to be a creator. You know if there's design, there's got to be a designer. You know if there's a moral law written on your heart, there's got to be a moral law giver. This is natural revelation. And even the Bible talks about natural revelation. In Romans 1, you get you get creation. In Romans 2, uh, you get conscience. In Romans 3, you get Christ. And only some people have Christ. 
I want to touch on what he's saying, that natural revelation is what also tells people that there is a God. For the question of what happens to those who never receive the gospel presentation or the gospel message, he's noting that God has put in place natural revelation, that nature itself reveals that there is a God. The right of Romans touches on these three aspects, first in Romans chapter 1, and then in Romans chapter 2, and then in Romans chapter 3. Now let's see the revelation that comes through creation you see this in romans chapter 1 i'm going to read from verse 19 to verse 20 it says they know the truth about god because he has made it obvious to them for ever since the world was created people have seen the earth and the sky through everything god made they can clearly see his invisible qualities through creation they can see god's invisible qualities his eternal power and divine nature so that they have no excuse for not knowing God, that creation itself point us to this understanding that there is a God. So people who are in unreached places, because there are still people, tribes and so forth, islands and so forth, where the gospel message is not hit. And the Bible seems to make this clear that those people can lean to what we know as natural revelation or the revelation that comes through nature. Where nature in itself, where creation in itself testifies that there is a God. It testifies of his invisible qualities. That's why you even find a lot of people becoming agnostics and not atheists because agnostics simply believe that we don't say there is a God, but also we don't dispute the fact that they could be a God. So they're in the middle ground. They don't reject the fact that there is a God, but also they don't accept the fact that there is a God. Why? Because when they look at creation, they can be complacent and comfortable with the fact that there is no God because creation in itself, the complexity of the design of the the universe and how everything is structured doesn't give them comfort to say there is no God. They come to a place where they know that there is something greater than us that is responsible for the creation and the design of the universe. They have just not come to a place where they can fully accept that to be God and that to be ultimately the God of the Bible. So creation in itself, for those who have never heard the gospel message, preaches that there is a God. And when God judges these people, he'll also judge them based on what creation had told them. The second thing that Frank touched on is what we know as conscious and the writer of romans speaks of this in chapter 2 when we read from verse 14 it says even gentiles who do not have god's written law gentiles is a word normally depicted to unbelievers show that they know his law when they instinctively obey it even without having heard it speaks of the conscious they demonstrate that god's law is written in their hearts for their own conscience and thoughts either accuse them or tell them that they are doing right and this is the message i proclaim that the day is coming when god through christ jesus will judge everyone's secret life now the writer of romans says that these people through their conscience are able to discern what is right and what is wrong. That's why Frank is saying that you don't have to go to the Bible to note that there is a God. Your conscience, even your conscience testifies that there is something higher than you, especially when it comes to morality and how to properly act. You don't have to be a Christian to know that killing someone is wrong. You don't have to have a Bible or read a verse in the Bible to know that stealing is wrong. These things have been engraved in our conscience that they are able to tell us and convict us of what is wrong and what is right. So God also in our conscience as humanity has wired us in a way that we understand things that are more acceptable and we understand things that are to be rejected. That God has written his law over our hearts. So those who have never received the gospel message, the Bible says God will judge them based on their secret life. God will judge them based on their conscience. When they had a conscience to do right, but they did wrong. When they had a conscience to be messy, but they were cruel. God will judge those people based on their conscience, based on the law, based on the things that were made known through their conscience. This is the second thing that we are seeing from scripture. Romans chapter 3 verse 21, it says, but now God has shown us a way to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law, as was promised in the writing of, writings of Moses and the prophets long ago. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. For everyone is sinned, we all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God in his grace freely makes us right in his sight. 
He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty for our sins. Now, the premise of how we come to Jesus and how we'll be judged will be based on the fact of did we place our faith unto Jesus. And this is the last thing. Frank spoke about creation. He spoke about conscious. And the last thing he touched on was Christ. This is how me and you have been saved. And for those who have been exposed to the gospel, this is the premise of how God will judge them. When he made available to them the message of Christ and the fact that Jesus is the one who can free us from the penalty of sin. Did we receive Christ or did we reject him? For those who have been exposed to the gospel, their judgment will be based on this. So God will judge people through creation. God will judge people through their conscience. And these are mostly people who never got the chance to hear the gospel presentation. But lastly, most of us who heard about Jesus, who heard about the saving Messiah, who heard about the Son of God who died for our sins and rose from the dead, who came to this world to redeem us from the chains and the penalties and the snare of the enemy and the snare of sin and the snare of death and destruction. Those who accept him will be judged as such and those who reject him will be judged as such. But one thing we also need to note is that the book of Psalms chapter 50 says that God is the judge of all things. That we might have glimpses in scripture of how God will ultimately judge people. But when it's all said and done, God is the one who will judge. However he will decide to judge on that faithful day, his judgment will be just because God is a just judge. These are things that the scriptures are trying to give us an idea on, but we are not all-knowing and we are not perfect judges ourselves. So whatever God will do in that faithful day will still be just and fair because that is who he is. So... You know from the effects of reality all around you that there's got to be some sort of moral creator out there. And the Bible indicates that if you take a step toward that evidence and want more, you'll get enough uh, information to be saved. You'll get the gospel. He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. But if you turn away from natural revelation and you don't want to learn anymore, Giving you more information isn't going to help. You're already turning away from the information you have. Mm. You shine a pen light in somebody's eye and they turn away. Shining a, you know, a spotlight in their face isn't going to help. They're going to go, get that thing out of here. Mm -hmm. So I've noticed this. I don't know if you have, Brandon, but I've noticed that in many of my discussions with non-believers, when I ask them, if Christianity were true, would you become a Christian? Most of the time, the honest answer is no. They don't want it to be true. They're not on a truth quest, they're on a happiness quest. That's that's very profound. I mean, more knowledge, more information doesn't automatically translate to more understanding. People might have information, they might have more evidence for God, but this does not necessarily translate that their understanding will also deepen. People often reject information, no matter how vast it is, based on their convictions in the first place. And he speaks of a very prominent and very powerful thing that people are not on a truth quest, but people are often on a happiness quest. That reason why many people reject the gospel is that the issue is not the evidence. The issue is the happiness. Is this evidence for the gospel? Is this gospel aligned with my happiness? Not is this gospel aligned with what is objectively true? So don't be discouraged even as you go out there and share the good news of Jesus. The issue when it comes to receiving the gospel is not the head. It's not the evidence for God. It's not what God can do for you. It's not what God can do through you, what God has done for many people. It's a hard issue where people don't want to let Christ come into their hearts and completely change them. Where happiness, satisfaction, money, prominence, fame is still in their heart. And as a result, that becomes a wall that actually makes it difficult for the gospel message to go through them and work concerning their lives. So Frank is touching on a very important thing here. That is not a head issue but it's a hard issue because people are in pursuit of happiness more than they are in pursuit of truth. I just wanted to bring this before you guys, especially with this huge question of what happens to those who never receive the message or who never hear about Jesus and also how will God judge those people. But also this is encouragement for me and you that people don't have to go through that in the first place. We must take the evidence for God. We must be able to take the word of God to people and tell them about Jesus. So I challenge you, 
this month, this week, today. Find someone that you'll share the gospel message with because this is a requirement for us who are saved. This is the whole premise behind the Great Commission. May God bless you. May God keep you until the next video. Grace and peace.